And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Dream Realm Storytellers, the recent, the recent Kickstarters of the Corpus Collection, con containing both the previously mentioned Corpus Malicious, as well as Corpus Angelus, and the settings of Mindabar and La and Laniel. The one and only Ek Ekin Topanaglu. Sorry, I, get, I screwed up Hello. the G again. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Oh. Hello, all. Nice to meet you. How are you, how are you, doing, how are you doing well today, I should say? I'm doing well. Uh, just business stuff. Mm -hmm. Today I was supposed to do some game uh, designing content, but then the business side of things got in the way, so I'm trying to handle them. All right, I, I got. But you. it's a good day. Mm -hmm. It is sunny after two, yesterday's rain, so it's fine. Yeah. It's in it's in the it's in the muggy end of th end of things. Um, over here, over yeah. here, because. It's in the it's it's that transitional period where it's n where um where it's not quite winter yet, but it's getting close. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course, fortunately, it means that temperatures are go are going down. But um, but that's just me. Um. Now, obviously, obviously, I obviously um I wasn't I wasn't around during the during the initial kickstart for. Um, Corpus Malicious, the the Codex of Evil. So I'd li I'd like to mm -hmm. I'd like to focus on that before we get to the other parts of the collection. Uh, yes, so, sure. So first off, the co the concept of of these sort of of these sort of codexes of good and evil. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person to ask this. But was there any inspiration from the old Book of Exalted Deeds and Book of Vile Darkness from D and D Third Edition? Well, there was actually um, Book of Exalted Deeds, and especially Book of Vile Darkness, was one of my most favorite books when I was back in the day playing uh, Three Point Five, mm -hmm. and when I was only a game master and a player, not a you know publisher. And I liked the books a lot because they gave a lot of content. And apparently, uh, my other colleagues had the same feelings for those book books as well. Uh, and then Ali Jan came with the idea that what if we should, what if we make a book of Codex of Evil for fifth edition because there aren't any. And we were a little bit uh, sad about the fact that fifth edition felt like more towards the good stuff. The good alignments, the heroes, and the good adventures, etc. And we wanted to show the darker side of the things because in we were used to playing all kinds of alignments in our games, mm -hmm. uh, even pure evil ones. So when Alija came with the idea, we just jumped on it. But we were very careful about not, to be honest, not to steal from Book of Wild Darkness. We wanted to give. Uh, the evilness in our content, but we wanted to do so without just copying it, you know, because it was another person's work, and we felt like we could do some things different. We could do the contents in our way, so we came up with our contents uh, for the book. So it is, yeah, inspired by Book of Wild Darkness, but it is quite different, actually, and when I'm from time to time comparing the two, uh, I might say we have done some more detailed work than they did uh, about some of the contents, such as poison crafting, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, to be well, to be fair, the man the mandate during the third edition days was add was was throw in more prestige classes into e into every single exp into every single splat book, even if it doesn't make any a lick of sense. Yeah. But don't put but don't <laughs> put them in the place where it would actually matter. Because we need to we need to put in more spells. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The... Okay. Hey. 
Ben oynayacağım bir yandır. Okay. Well, hello, hello there, hello there, town school. Welcome, welcome, hey. to, welcome to the sh welcome to the show. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, to catch to catch you up, I was I was um I was just asking on the origins when it when it came to the when it came to whether or not um the old Book of Vile Darkness and and Book of Exalted Deeds um served as inspiration. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and. With that, with that kind of thing in mind, since obviously, a lo obviously, a lot of, um, a lot of varied set, a lot of varied um, align alignments and ba and backgrounds are played. Um, I do, I do want to address one particular. I I keep using this phrase a lot, but it keeps happening. Elephant in the room that's taken a crash on my couch. Is the nature is the nature of playing e playing evil characters in a ca in a campaign um generally speaking if someone wanted if someone wanted to do a campaign with evil aligned characters um what's the general advice that you usually give them okay so um if i am answering this question uh i can say that uh there should be a common goal uh, for for the players so they should serve the same demonic lord or lady or uh, they if they serve different powers different forces uh, they should they they should want to destroy the same city for example so there should be a thing mm -hmm. that uh, keeps them together and uh, preventing them to betray themselves at least for a while And um, good. According to my opinion, uh, I'm a huge fan of Vampire, uh, the World of Darkness uh, books. Mm -hmm. Although Alijan knows more about them uh, than me, <laughs> all kinds of demon and mage and everything. But I'm very much into. I'm more into playing Vampire games than into D and D actually. And yeah. what I've seen in Vampire is there are hooks and relationship. Uh, tensions that create the culture in place. How can I say this? Uh, okay, in Vampire, you don't necessarily play the good guys. Actually, the motto of the Vampire is you play the monster. So, in that kind of a sense, everybody has different goals and everybody has different kind of hooks, different kind of, perhaps, secrets and everything. And the culture is really in a tense position where nobody is fit together out of a heroic quest, you know? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you are creating this web of characters, relationships in with hooks and tensions and little threads or perhaps two sires dedicated their children to work together. They gave the order. So apart from a common goal or a common lord or a common uh, ruler that, the, that rules the party, you can also create this tangible balance uh, that... It's kind of a game theory where betraying each other does not benefit the goals of the characters as a party. Mm -hmm. So that can also uh, create a good evil uh, party. And also another thing is that evil does not necessarily mean that they cannot love or they cannot like each other. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there are some criminal examples in the real world, like Bonnie and Kyle, was it? Bonnie and Kyle. Bonnie and Clyde, they are two lovers, but they are gangsters and they are basically merging people. Mm -hmm. But they are in love with each other. Although they are evil, they like each other. So in a sense that characters may like each other, may be friends with each other, although they are evil. Mm -hmm. And we have seen this in our latest game of Sabbat, in Ali Jam's game, where we are basically monsters, but as the coterie, as the pack, we really like each other. So we can give our lives, basically, to protect one another, whereas we don't even look twice when a human gets murdered, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, now with that in mind, um, I'd like to I'd, I'd like to ask on on um on some of the goal some of the goals that you get that you guys had with um 
with cor with corpus with corpus with corpus malicious. One of the the things that because obviously there, obviously there's the whole factor of wanting to introduce evil characters and campaigns, but um what. But be, but was were there certain specific thing were there certain specific things that you wanted to emphasize within that? Uh, what do you mean by the specific things? Um, in ter in terms of in terms of certain styles of e of evil care of evil characters, since just introducing evil characters in campaigns is a very wide net. Yeah. Uh... Okay, so we we all had actually different secret, uh, not secret, but secondary goals in that sense. Uh, we did that as a collaboration, as we always do. Mm -hmm. But of course, with the latest adventure, uh, Freya's Tears, uh, we weren't doing like that. But in codexes, we tend to collaborate. So each person brings their own flavor to the what we are trying to do, in the terms of not taking a sp step apart from the general main team. So, for example, uh, Alijan simply uh, went for the evil versions that we were used to see in the 3.5. Like, uh, we have some evil paladins uh, and other classes. Mm -hmm. I was more like, I tried to do some more gray characters, such as I, I designed Shade, for example, the Shade Rook. And shape does not necessarily be have to be evil, but it can of course be so. And also the I designed, for example, a uh, circle of bones, which is a druid, a druid circle, but it is not about life, but it is about death. And it was inspired from a real uh, druid, druidic lore that I've seen in the media. Mm -hmm. So we all had our different approaches, actually. Uh, some of us went for like, okay, let let this let make let's make this class or actually archetype evil, like playable by evil and a great evil class for a player who wishes to play evil. Mm -hmm. But other classes are more like gray. You can be evil, but you don't have to be. You necessarily cannot be good, but you can be that. You know, kind of a punisher, sort of a hero, or a you know that's that that person in between. I will say, mm -hmm. like a dark vigilante or something. So yeah, we all had our different flavors and things we wanted to accomplish uh, with Corpus Malicious. So we have more than one uh, thoughts in mind when we were designing it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Obvious, obviously, there, obviously, there's a there's a great deal of um, subclass additions within Corpus Malicious, but you guys also and en also ended up adding one new class in the form of the witch. Um, mm -hmm. Now, was was it always was it always the plan to have to have the witch be it be its own class, or were or were there attempts to make it a subclass, but it just got it just got too big for that? Well, I would say um, I have done two classes so far in my uh, designer D and D designer life, mm -hmm. and both of them I'm really happy that I made them classes because I thought they weren't they weren't small enough to fit into archetypes. I I wouldn't feel good if I fitted a uh, witch into mage or something, into the wizard or something. Mm -hmm. Or I wouldn't feel good if I tried to fit Seder into Druid, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, because they felt larger than that, and I I tried my best to uh, imitate that largeness, that vastness they provide. And one of the things also, not, it's kind of out of concept, but uh, one thing I'm not... F I'm a little bit sad about is about the witch is that I had to put the witch class in Corpus Malicious, even though I don't think the witch class has to be evil. It can pretty much be a great good character, and you know the religion or the the belief of Wiccanism, Wiccans and stuff, uh, they they deserve to be represented in. Uh, wide spectrum, not only in an evil book, but 
because many people are stereotypical about the witch and it would go well in that book and I had the chance, I decided that I can, yeah, I will put witch into this. And I put witch into the uh, Corpus Malicious. But in, te- in terms of game design, it is really tough because simply DMD uh, tried to cover all the core mechanical and mathematical aspects of the game with the classes. So designing the bitch in terms of game mechanics and mathematical ways was kind of tough. At first, it was kind of in between everything. And still, some people may feel like it is in between everything. But I try to, I try my best to make it unique, different than all, different than all the classes. But still, there are some, uh, so there are some, how can I say, uh, inspirations from other classes. I guess mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. Now, before to kind to kind of put a capstone on the on the witch. Um, what, aside, <laughs> what would, if you had, if you had to, if you had to pitch that class to, to others, um, who had, who had already, da- who had already dabbled in other casting classes like the Warlock, Druid, and, um, Wizard, um, what specifically would you say that it, that it brings to the table before, um, you factor in subclasses? Um... Which, uh, in uh, role-playing wise, uh, which is more about uh, making magic with feelings Mm -hmm. and teachings, oral teachings, like uh, vocal teachings from their uh, masters. Whereas, for example, wizard is more like symbols, symbolism and glyphs and uh, sacred lore of arcane and stuff, for example. Uh, which is more like a feeling. It is not quite like sorcerer in that sense, like sorcerer just can do magic, you know, without even, with just intuition, which is more like, which, okay, wizard thinks about the arcane and does it, whereas witch feels about the arcane and does it. Uh, in that sense, which is more like, as I said, uh, a, a class based on feelings and what feels to be the right channel of a magic, I would say. And of course, which has three very different uh, archetypes in that sense. We have this stereotypical infernal witch, which is like a warlock, but it is not. It is like a pact with the devil, but you are making spells uh, like a witch that we know from the media. Or there is this Conant witch who is like more of a support character, actually. Mm-hmm. If we think that Wizard is a damage dealer character, for example, although Wizard can be support, of course, with also all those spells, uh, Covenant is Covenant, which is more like uh, more powerful in the support section of things. So it is kind of like a cleric in that sense, but uh, the support it brings is different mm-hmm. from anything else. Yeah. So yeah, this this became a long answer for uh, just a small pitch, but yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's what I can say. All right. Now, wh- now, um, was given the fact that the corpus malicious is only one is only one half of it, I think I think it'd be it'd be remiss of me to not cover the other half of it. What with, with um the cor- with the corpus angelus and. <laughs> The first question that I have on that was, was it was it always part of what, uh, um, how did you want to differentiate the kind of good that's that's typically used in a lot of um, fantasy gaming from the from the codex of from the codex of well good that it that is going to be the cor- the Corpus Angelus. Uh, so. Uh... So with with the given contents uh, of the with the given contents of uh, Wizards of the Coast in the books of Wizards of the Coast, mm-hmm. uh, people can create many uh, good aligned characters, many different good aligned characters. But the uh, the Corpus Angelus works with the team of good more deeply, uh, and especially on the aspect of angels and heaven, mm-hmm. or the ultimate good side of nature. Mm-hmm. 
So the 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 archetypes in Corpus Angelus, um, if we put it simply, they shine and they bring holy fire and uh, they do the uh, work of the heavens and uh, they, as they grow powerful, uh, they become more and more angelic. Not all of them, but most of them uh, does such things. They have they have wings, they have uh, swords shining with holy fire, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And given the, given the fact that it's that the focus is on the um, angel and angel end of things. Um, I would I I would like to get uh, to delve into um, how th how that's covered with so how that's covered with the most forward facing part of it that being um, classes and subclasses. Now, as I under as I understand it, there's are, there's already a ha there's already a handful of there's already a handful of them, and I would I would. I would like to I would like to delve into a few just to get and get kind of a feel for what it for what it's bringing to the table in ter in terms of its particular um cl in terms of its particular class. Okay, so uh, shall we talk about the features or something right now? Um, what I'd like what I'd like to cover is obviously if we covered the features we'd be here all week, but. Um, what, I'm more, <laughs> what I'm more aiming for with this is the ge is the general f is the general feel of okay, of, okay, the, okay, okay. of that of that particular subclass, and I'll start at the top with the angel caller. Okay, okay. So um, uh, in uh, in Corpus Malicious, uh, there was a warlock, the blasphemous incantator. Uh, the blasphemous incantator uh, works differently than other warlocks. Uh, they uh, they call uh, demons. They call fiends, actually, uh, even if even if it is against their will, and use their power by force. Mm -hmm. But uh, the angel caller cleric. Uh, works with angels they call for their aid and if the angel sees fit uh, they came and helped the angel caller they they grant their, a portion of their power to the angel caller uh, so that they can use it and act as the hand the herald of the the, the angels the heaven mm -hmm. uh, walking on earth so uh, the, the the main difference between uh, the Corpus Malicious and Corpus Angelus archetypes is that actually. So in Corpus Malicious, uh, they the archetypes get the power. Okay, they they do not ask for permission. Okay, because because they can do that. But in Corpus Angelus, they work with the forces of good. They do not force anything. The the same thing uh, applies for the demonologue wizard, the demonologist wizard, and they. Uh, uh, heaven caller, the 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 the, uh, the heaven caller wizard. So the celestial summoner wizard, actually, uh, by the true name. Uh, the demonologist wizard mm -hmm. binds demons and uh, use their power against their will. But celestial summoner asks for aid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, celestial summoner summons an angel and uh, asks for help, help, and if the angel sees fit, it helps. Mm -hmm. Now, what? Now, with that, in, with that in mind, since uh, since we covered the since we covered the witch class that's getting that's getting at that was in um, Corpus Malicious, I'd be remiss if I didn't cover the opposite end of things with um, Corpus Angelus, and that is the Paragon. Yes. Oh, uh, obvious, obviously. Now, with what is the ge what is the general um, thematic vibe for the pa for the Paragon class? So the Paragons are the best of their religion, the best of the temple members. Uh, so they are not paladins, they are not clerics. Uh, they are they are Paragons. Uh, they as they grow in power, they 
be more and more like their uh, deities, their gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. uh, the the main feature of the paragon is the avatar form, and uh, in the avatar form they can get in an avatar form, and uh, while in this form, uh, paragons can use many different abilities that reflects the dogmas of their uh, deity and their religion. Okay, they are they are the exemplar of their temple. And with it, would the would are the given the fact that the witch is a is a casting class are paragons a casting class as well? Uh, no, actually, uh, but uh, paragon has this uh, flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, so you can you can play as a spellcaster. Not uh, although you do not has you do not have many spells while playing paragon. But you can you can cast you can still cast many spells if you build your paragon in this way. Mm -hmm. But you can as well uh, wield two great swords and summon and summon a golden armor mm -hmm. and uh, charge into the fray. So uh, paragon gives the flexibility to play many different play styles. Mm -hmm. So uh, and and uh, it does so uh, by 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 that. Uh, Paragon class does not give specific features at specific uh, levels mostly. So there are feature pools that you can pick from at certain levels. Mm -hmm. And when you get this level, when you get that levels, you pick one of the features that you can. And uh, by this way, you can build many, many, many different paragons that can fit to many, many different religions in fantasy settings. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to then ask about devotion paths. Um, is the way... Would the, would the devotion... Would, how did the concept of devotion paths, these, uh, this, um, this point-based this point reward set up based on following certain deeds while avoiding certain sins um, come about? Uh, so, so let's, talk, let's give an example. Let's talk about a character mm -hmm. that, tries to, that always tries to protect their party members, the loved ones, mm -hmm. and the innocents. So, uh, of course, in narrative style, uh, in the narrative of the game, the character can get some rewards for this protection. But uh, by using these devotion paths, a deity of, devo a deity of protection can, uh, can notice this character and chooses the reward for, its, for, for their good deeds. Uh, so most of, the, uh, most of the good stories, good teen stories, are about devoting themselves to religion, Devoting, uh, devoting to a path, devoting to a cause, devoting to a temple, to a religion. So this should be rewarding, we said. And uh, we rewarded the players for that. Oh, all right. And I'm get, I know that in the, in, in the preview, only one, there was only one entry for it. But I'm, get, I'm guessing that there are, multiple, there are going to be multiple devotion paths in the full book. Yes, a lot of them. Many, many of them. Oh, all right. Now, when it now when it comes to when it, it, but in addition to those two books, there are two um s there are two setting books that are also be are also being put in um into into this co into this particular collection. And th those I, those I'd like those I'd like to delve into a bit. That being um, Laniel and um, Mindabar. Let's let's start with Laniel. Um, the, fl okay. the floating si the floating city. Um, what can you t what can you tell me about th about that particular um se that particular setting? Is is it is it more of a urban sandbox or or is there or is there um something bigger? Um, it is definitely not a sandbox, mm -hmm. we will say. Uh, it has all its districts designed very specifically. And um, 
in Loniel, of course, uh, Izel is the main person who is in charge of Loniel, as she was in, in charge of Mindalar. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I can say is, uh, Loniel is sort of a last anchor against evil for all the realms it can, it can reach to. Uh, it is the bastion between the evil forces of uh, extraplanetar realms mm -hmm. and uh, people, the mortals of the known realms in many planets. Um, so, actually, Loniel, the where Loniel was built upon was uh, sort of a uh, it's like city of sigil, where, you know, many gates are able to open to many other areas, uh, many other realms. But of course, in, in sigil, uh, there's this lady of pain who is who has absolute power. Mm -hmm. But um, we are kind of sort of also trying to build our own, own cosmology, we can say, uh, apart from D&D and D&D's cosmology. And in our uh vision uh we don't have sigil but we have this of course it is up to the gm who plays the books so, but uh, we don't have the sigil but we have this on uh not owned territory where many portals can reach to many places mm -hmm. and if these portals are under demonic or fiendish control that would mean very bad things about many realms so thus the angelic realms invaded this place and created these cities on top of rocks, uh, these floating cities, uh, to protect these portals uh, from fiends or other evil entities or for even far out creatures, for, perhaps, uh, to protect the known realms against them. Mm -hmm. But also, in a sense, it is it is like this utopic. In within itself, even though it is under great threats, within itself it is sort of an utopia state where you can go there and get into philosophical discussions about goodness, about many paths, many beliefs, like the ancient Greece philosophers. You know, like there is this heavenly and uh, passionate vibes about the place itself. Some people go there for their absolute devotion. Some go there for uh, for discovering new realities of their faith or of their beliefs, of their philosophies. So the unlike Mindabar, where the city invites you to this very tempting evilness and freedom, uh, Lonia is more like. Uh, an invitation to the community, to being together, to serving each other, mm -hmm. and all those good and humble things, I would say. But of course, Alijan can add more because they were working more with Izal on this matter. Yeah. Now, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I can I can also say that uh, while while the uh, readers. Uh, while the people are reading Mindavar, uh, they will surely uh, feel that they are in the city of absolute evil. Okay, every street reeks of evil. Every every everywhere smells of corruption, mm -hmm. and 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 this is funny in a way. Uh, they, they will uh, they will enjoy it. I am sure of that. And while in uh, Lunial, uh, they will feel the power of angels and the good, and the and the safety. Yeah, I am. I am sure of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the key thing one of the key things that I feel I feel is important to ask, um, especially when, especially when adventuring in in what is this, what is essentially a um, a mega city, is the kind is the kind of story seeds that can be delved into in in these particular places. I, um. Especially, especially in a place like La like Laniel, which um, could which could easily have the assumption of be of being too, of coming off too uto coming off too utopian. So, I'd like to I'd like to ask what sort of what sort of potential story seeds could be delved into, what sort what sort of campaign seeds could be could be explored in Mindabar and Laniel, respectively. 
Okay, so so for Mindavar it is easy actually because uh, there are there are different stories everywhere. Okay, there are there are many potentials of uh, dangers, um, opportunities, and uh, in in every corner of the city. So people, a player may want to uh, may want to live in Mindavar to get in higher ranking places or even want or even prove it. But uh, for Loniel, uh, it was a bit hard actually, uh, because uh, at, because at first we thought we we wanted to create a city of absolute power and absolute goodness, but uh, this limited the potential stories, the pot potential goods a bit. So we we also placed uh, we also created a story so to so that we can place seeds of uh, evilness, seeds of corruption, so that good players can also play in this city. So for both cities, uh, it is applicable that good characters may want to destroy Mindavar or evil characters may want to destroy uh, Lonier. But uh, the reverse should be possible. And we wanted to uh, create cities so that we can apply this uh, idea also. All right. All, all right. I can, I can certainly get. I can certainly get behind that. Um, and with with that particular with that particular thing in mind, with um, were there any were there any um were there any lessons that you guys t that you guys took from the experience of creating um, Corpus Malicious that you wanted to apply to the creation of Corpus Angelus? Uh, we did actually, but they are mainly about, uh, well, our imagination and the uh, passion to create content never changes. Mm -hmm. It's at with every new book, it becomes easier, even though we from time to time get afraid that, okay, we create all this content for this book. What if we get out of content? for the next one or the next one after that but it never happens uh thankfully and what i feel is and perhaps many of us feel the same that with each new book we we just start to feel more relaxed and more creative about our work and create things more easy so the content creation path part is uh always getting better with each new book. Mm -hmm. But the most lessons we have learned from Corpus Malicious that we carried to the Freya's Tears and then to Corpus Angelus is how we work, actually. Uh, to be honest, we before the reviews, we are revising our content after we are writing it. And in the revisions, we tended to skip some stuff. Or in the edits, we tended to skip some stuff. Or sometimes things were left to the very last time where in the layouts we have to solve stuff mm -hmm. uh, but the layout uh, period the layout time is not the time for that actually it should have been before uh, so alijan worked as a game as our lead game designer now alijan worked a lot to bring everybody in this on the same page that we should be careful about how to write certain powers, certain spells, certain abilities, mm -hmm. which words should be used specifically, which wording or which sentencing we should use specifically, and how we should check our work uh, specifically before we are uh, putting it to revision or putting it to layout or even putting it to edit. So we are learning a lot in the sense that how we work, mm -hmm. uh, how we produce because we had our gaps we had our weaknesses we had our uh, i would say mistakes in the previous books but in each new book uh, we are trying to make sure that we learn from those mistakes and make our production better sometimes it takes alijan to bash some heads to the walls or something <laughs> of course not literally but <laughs> to bring us to the place bring us to the how it should be done including me 
I have to admit. Uh, but yeah, we are getting there, and it is really thankfully to Alijan, I would say that he is working a lot to improve our production, improve our game designing production mm -hmm. uh, methods to our best of our capacities that we have learned so far. I would say. All right. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> now. <laughs> With the, now, with that in mind, the um, cor um, corpus corpus malicious was a whopping four was a whopping four hundred and ten pages, and Mindabar was nine was ninety three pages. Is that roughly the same the same page count that you get that you guys are aiming for for um, Corpus Angelus and La and Laniel respectively? Yes, um, Lonia will be at the same length with Mindabar. Mm -hmm. Corpus Angelus will be sm slightly shorter than uh, Corpus Malicious, but that is only because we did not include uh, backer characters this time. Mm -hmm. Because in Corpus Malicious, although we enjoyed all the backer characters a lot, they, they were really, really cool backer characters in Corpus Malicious, but the process was... I have to admit, uh, we couldn't handle the backer character creation process very well. It was really tough for us. It was, uh, I would say, tough for them to communicate, to cooperate, to make things finish in time, I have to say. And because of that, we and now we are writing many contents at once. We are, some people are writing other new contents than Corpus Angelus, as we are, we moved a lot in Corpus Angelus at this point. Uh, we didn't have the power and the process abilities to include the backer characters again. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the only things missing in Corpus Angelus are those, the backer characters. But we will, of course, include more NPCs to, uh, you know, compensate for that. Mm -hmm. But that's the only... That's the only part that is missing. Other than that, they are very identical. They are very uh, similar in terms of their content. I have to say. All right. Now, what do you shoot? What do you? Sh I realize things have gotten have gotten kind of chaotic over there. But um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the digital copies? Uh, the digital copies will be uh, released in next in a year from now. I will say, actually, in a year from uh, September. Mm -hmm. So in August, we are aiming to finish uh, delivering the digital copies, the Corpus Angelus and Minda, uh, Corpus Angelus and Loniel and art book and the lore books, the stretch goals. Mm -hmm. Uh, Corpus Malicious and Mindabar, their PDFs are already being delivered right now. We sent the service. We are sending the uh, PDF links from Drive to RPG. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in Corpus Malicious, due to some unexpected unexpected latencies, such as uh, we did not integrate the time to time for the stretch goals in our production time, but we had to, but we didn't do so. And what happened was the stretch goals took more time and because of that there were some slight latencies. But the major latency in Corpus Malicious Kickstarter was due to the global pandemic affecting the logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, many firms are really in a bad shape about the logistics. They are take, trying to take their freights, their box of pallets of books uh, to the warehouses where they will deliver. Mm -hmm. But the logistics are basically locked up or they are very expensive uh, from places such as China to US to EU, for example. This time we made sure we had a lot of time to finish everything. And we have a year until, uh, until we will deliver the PDFs in August. But I can say uh, it may be sooner because more than half of the book is already done. And nearly half of the book is already revised and a quarter of the book is already edited. So we officially we gave a lot of time for it, but we can surprise our backers by making it shorter than that, I have to say.
Mm-hmm. Now, with, now with the with that said, I will I will know. I will note that I am I'm certainly going to be looking forward to seeing what you get seeing what you guys have um have con have conjured up in that in that regard and and hey if it's cut if if the final phases are in August I'll cu I'll count that as a I'll count that as a birthday present to myself <laughs> <laughs> That's nice <Yeah. laughs> So we will make sure we will deliver at that time uh, By the way, can give you your birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, I must also add that today is my birthday, and this and this uh, conversation is my birth birthday present. So uh, <laughs> I, I I can return the favor by that. Yeah, I'll I'll take I'll take this. I would say I'd take this over chocolate cake, but um, <laughs> but that's that's on the list. That's on the list of things I can't have. Um, but with thank you. but with all with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and coming coming all the way back up to the temple to enjoy the madness at play here. Oh, we thank yeah, you. It's our, it's, yeah, we thank you. It's our pleasure to uh, talk to you again. Mm -hmm. We don't do this uh, most of the time. We are just writing by ourselves. So it's really great to communicate with others from the community that we can hardly reach in terms of face to face. You know, we are living all the way in Turkey, and it feels really good to uh, talk with people about what we are doing. And it's it's really nice that you invited us again. Uh, for this conversation, so we thank you for this. It, and it feels it, it feels good to meditate in this temple again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, true. And and as always, anytime you guys see fit to return to the, to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> thank you. And oh, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs> <laughs>